Good afternoon again. Um, I think uh, Grace was on mute, but I hope now you can hear me. Uh, I just want to kick off about uh, 238 in Kenya. Um, so with the permission of all, maybe we can start off. We had registered around 200 participants. So far, I see the room has about 68 uh, and they still continue coming in. So we will, um, I think we will continue to receive them as they do come in, but uh, we can kick off um, this, uh, this, uh, this webinar. So thank you again for making the time everyone today uh, and being able to join us uh, as we, this is a milestone for Kenik uh, as we do our first webinar and um, we are gracious that you've agreed to be with us today. Now, just for some housekeeping rules, um, we, we request that if you have any questions uh, to any of the panelists or in general, put them on the chat box. Uh, there's a question and answer, there's a Q&A facility that uh, one can actually put in a question and the panelists will be able to see that and respond whether on chat or within the conversations that we shall be having. We anticipate to have an hour of this and we are recording. So Andrew, yes, we shall be able to share the webinar recording after this um, event. Again, uh, if you have any comments to make, make them in the chat room. We may allow, depending on time, for some questions, some people to actually be unmuted to ask some questions, uh, if there are any burning questions that we may have. But for now, let's use the chat facility and the question and answer facility for us to be able to uh, respond as we go along. So again, thank you. Some interesting things, just before I introduce um, uh, myself and uh, Kenick and the, and the panelists, as I said earlier, we have so far 200 people that registered. Uh, interesting, a very wide scope of participants, uh, mostly obviously from Kenya, but we have some from the US, we are from Botswana, we are from UK, we are from South Africa, we're from India, which just shows us that there's uh, the need for us to, we're a global village and people are willing to talk to each other and people are willing to reach out to seek information. Some of the key industries that we've noted that you work in are advertising and marketing and PR. Uh, a lot of you are from consulting, a lot again from tech, uh, communication background and legal. And uh, this just gives us a broad spectrum of everyone who's on the call and who we're going to be talking to and talking with uh, this day. Uh, obviously, we are on different time zones, so I'll just use this day as depending on where you are around the world. So let me start off with, um, do you want us to just look at the poll results or give it a few minutes? Okay. So let me just introduce Kenick and why we're doing this today. So for those of you who may know or not know Kenick, Kenick is uh, our mandate. Sorry. All right. So our mandate as Kenick is to provide businesses with the opportunity to market products and services online uh, using a .ke platform. So we are the country code top level domain, a company that was formed to assist the country in getting um, the right domains uh, using our platform, which is .ke, and ensuring that every Kenyan is able to use a unique identifier, which is a Kenyan domain name. So our existence pretty much sits around the fact that we sell domain names, and our mandate is to ensure as many Kenyan businesses or individuals have domain names. How we operate is from what we call a 3R model, which I will not go too much into, but basically we do registrations through registrars, and I know some of them are on this call. And then their work is to actually register on behalf of registrants and ensuring that um, anyone and anyone and everyone can actually have a domain name that is unique to them. So as we were sitting as a team and we asked ourselves, okay, so as Kenick, our work is to register domain names and that's good, but what is the internet ecosystem talking about, especially during this pandemic times? What are we discussing? What is the challenges people are going through? And we've seen that a lot of webinars are happening and that is good and a lot of information is flowing. But as a team, we asked ourselves, which are the pain points some may have? 
And uh, to that end, then we started having deliberations on which are the topics that we want to have. And we'll share some of the deliberations that we had as we go along. But the first thing we asked ourselves, people are going online. So every day new businesses are being set up. Um, people are wanting to be more, uh, to have a digital presence, being able to talk people online. So there's a lot more activity that is happening online. And that speaks to the fourth industrial resolution where now we are talking about ICT as being the driver of business. So then we asked ourselves, okay, so if I'm going online, what are the challenges that I might be facing? So we started this conversation. So one was online branding. So how do I brand myself online? So we were having a tete -a -tete earlier today and people are saying, how should I look online? Uh, we've seen images of people in pajamas, uh, some have shorts and a tie. How do I look online? That's one, as a person. Two, as, as my organization, how does my website look? How do, how do people react, react with me and talk to me online? So we asked ourselves, what's our online branding? What's my presence online? That became the, the basis of the conversation we were going to have. Then someone asked, okay, now that I am online, what does that mean? Am I safe? Have I, do I have the right security to be online? Have I taken the right measures? Two, when I get online, what are the legal implications that I need to look at? So then we started having that conversation again around what are the legal aspects that we need to look at and what is the norm? So in a nutshell, the conversation that we are trying to have today is one, how should I look online? What are the considerations I should take when I am online? Three, how do I secure myself, my data, and even the people that I am interacting with online? So that is going to be the gist of the conversation today. And to that end, then we started looking for experts in the market who uh, have dealt with such conversations, are currently doing this in their own private businesses, and asking them this question. So we, we've gotten a list of panelists, and you may have seen from the, from the Twitter um, and other social media platforms of who our panelists are and what they do. And we're going to invite them to just give us some opening remarks on their thought process around their topic and what we should look out for. So probably like a playbook of do's and don'ts and things that have happened. So I will now then introduce the panelists and I will do this by asking each of the panelists to give a brief of their topic and what are the few things that they will want to share with us then we'll come back into a question and answer. Thank you again for those who joined because we've also gotten some questions which we shall be addressing during that time. But as we go along, we anticipate that there'll be more questions based on what you hear from them. And we invite you to actually interact. So I will be moderating the questions and showing that as many questions as we get will be answered. And those that we can't, then we shall consolidate. And when we send out the, the, the live um, the recording, we then will also want to address some of those things. So the first topic we discussed was about online branding and how you should look online. And to that, we invited uh, Moses Kemibaro, who is the founder and CEO of DotSurvey. Now, for those of you in the marketing, PR and agency business, I don't think this is a new name to you. He's been around, uh, Moses, I think more than 20 plus years in the business. Uh, he was the first digital business agency that conceptualizes and develops and manages high performance business results for clients via digital channels. So his selling point is the fact that we want to go digital. What does that mean for you? How do we make that happen for you? So creating for you a journey map that is able to get you onto digital platforms. Before Dot Survey, he worked at uh, Inmobi where he led the sales for Kenya, Egypt, and Nigeria and Ghana. He was a founding re regional manager at Delfish East Africa which was uh, for most of you formerly known as OLX. That was the trading name in the country. Uh, he's led uh, a lot of digital classified uh, platforms now known as Gigi Kenya. Moses, again, for those of you who know, blogs a lot, a lot about technology, and he has his own um, website, moseskimebero.com, where he usually rants and raves about all things digital uh, in Kenya and Africa. Uh, and is a long-suffering but loyal Arsenal football fan. Uh, and I've seen, he's told me he aspires to be a mountain biker. Uh, but at the moment, I think he's left himself to Formula One as his sport of choice. So Moses, I want to invite you just to give us some opening remarks 
uh, in regards to choosing domain names and building your digital brand. Karibu sana. Uh, thank you so much, Joel. Uh, much appreciated. Uh, so happy to be here with Kenik. Um, being with Kenik from the early days of uh, registering domain names and setting up our own namespace and really, really um, looking forward to talking a little bit about more of the branding considerations that go into choosing and actually utilizing a domain name to enhance your marketing performance. Karibu. Asante. Moses, you can go on. Oh, sorry. So, um, so in a nutshell, I think um, for this presentation today, we'll basically be touching a little bit more about the specifics around, um, you know, how you choose a domain name. You know, what are the things you need to look out for? Uh, what are the key considerations, especially when you have even product uh, uh, domain names, and also some of the um, the key considerations around how you can defend or protect your brand. Uh, within a digital context so that you can get maximum value um, from a sort of a domain name strategy uh, within your digital marketing. Moses, do you want to turn on your video? Oh, you sorry. Okay? Yeah. Uh, just a moment. Yeah, that's fine. Okay. Uh, Okay, Joel, did you want us to start the presentation? Yeah, go, go ahead. Go ahead, Moses. Yeah, okay, do you want me to share the screen? Yes, please. So you want us to get into the presentation right now? Yes. Okay. Uh, just uh, enable screen sharing, please. Okay, so uh, just very briefly, um, is that visible, I hope? Yes, yes, we can see it. Okay, thank you. So just to get us started, why have a domain name? I think ultimately it gives your brand a unique and transparent identity online so that consumers uh, can relate to it in a contextual manner. They know who you are, they know who, what you offer. And ultimately it's almost like having a passport or an identity on the internet. Um, as of this writing, um, we know that there's at least 100,000 um, domain names under .ke, but also at the same time, we know that there's a user population of the internet of over 20 million in the country. So what this suggests is that there's a massive opportunity uh, for you essentially to get the domain name you want and need for your brand uh, within the .ke space. Uh, it also means that it gives you more choices for the exact domain that you're looking for. We've seen people register strange domain names, uh, usually under the... Uh, you know, under .com and others where they've had to sort of make compromises in the name. Um, but if you're looking at, you know, securing a .ke, then you really will get the preferred domain. Um, it gives you a uniquely Kenyan identity, especially now on the internet when there's so many shady websites doing all sorts of funny things. Uh, this really ensures that you have a uniquely Kenyan identity. And as we speak currently, uh, .ke domain names are generally uh, more cost effective um, giving you the ability to register more and more domain names at an affordable price. Other considerations when you're looking to acquire a domain name, um, you may want to, first of all, secure a domain name for your corporate brand, but also your products and services. We see brands and organizations like Unilever where they have a corporate brand and then they have the consumer brands that people know and love. And they often would register across the board an entire domain portfolio because that becomes a defensive strategy for their domains. Um, you may also have microsites and landing pages usually for your microsites uh, for these the subdomains. And then also, you know, it's a protection and it guarantees you the deserved traffic when uh, you alias your name. So another thing you're able to do is that when you register many domain names that are specific to brand or corporate is domain name aliasing, which means that you can point multiple domain names to the same website or landing page. And this is a beautiful thing because if you can imagine that people know your brands and your portfolio products, and you secure these domain names, then chances are they're going to go into Google or they're going to go to the web browser and enter the actual domain name for the brand and come directly to your uh, website. So this is a good defensive strategy. 
so that people uh, cannot take your domain names and use them in, in sort of unsavory manners and try and sort of squat on your main domain name for other reasons. Um, other considerations, sorry, let me come back, is something we call, um, apologies, let me, uh, called direct navigation. So direct navigation is a scenario where uh, because of, of the strength of a brand in the digital space, people will presumably type in the domain name without necessarily uh, going to Google, which we call direct navigation. So consider the value of a domain name like kenyaairways.co.ke versus kenya-airways.co.ke in this instance. More than likely, somebody's going to go to kenyaairways.co.ke without the hyphen because they'll presume that is the brand name or they'll go to kq.co.ke because KQ is known by the acronym Kenya, uh, KQ as the sort of their call sign. So think about the fact that as a, as a brand or domain name, consumers are not going to necessarily search or even look for your domain. They might just want to go to a browser and key in directly. It's also really, really important. And this is something we see, especially in you know, scenarios like the Premier League, where uh, website addresses are constantly on you know, the uniforms, on the stadium, making sure that all marketing collaterals are pulling you towards that particular domain name. And also this is beautiful because if you've built a strong brand, then you don't have to pay for traffic because people will presume the address and come directly to your websites. Um, when choosing a domain name, um, more important than anything, choose a domain name that is consistent with your brand rather than generic ones. Um, you also want to look for branded domain names that have more consumer value. Uh, we know for a fact that when it comes to keywords, Google tends to rank you higher for your domain name when it's within the brand as such uh, for the domain. And it's a keyword signal that Google uses uh, when they're trying to rank your website. So think about how important that is in terms of getting found uh, either for the generic keywords or phrases or branded keywords and phrases that people use on Google. Another consideration is that you want to acquire domain names that are shorter in length, more concise, so that you can have more brand memorability so that over time, people will just know that whether it's an acronym or it's your actual brand name, uh, it's a much easier way for them to actually find you and the same would also apply to email addresses when they're trying to communicate with you. Typically, we also recommend to avoid hyphens and numbers because these are not easy to remember. Um, and also look for domains that are easy to type and pronounce. Make sure that the, the verbal or spoken aspect of that domain name is quite similar to the written one so that as you communicate or you mention it, people can easily type it out. Uh, branding is key. Uh, so making sure that um, all professional communications are, are branded. Um, if you received a proposal, for instance, from somebody sending you a Gmail uh, email address versus their own personalized brand name, which one would you take more seriously? So generally, you want to make sure that you know, your branded communications will allow you to look more professional. Uh, also making sure that your brand or your registered domain name do not fall short or foul of any trademark issues or intellectual property, as the consequences can be very severe. Um, other considerations, if you can't find a domain name that is relevant to your brand organization, then it's quite possible to use a domain name brokerage. Um, and these are people who actually, um, on behalf of a brand or an organization that needs to get a domain name that's already been acquired, you can actually uh, require this, uh, acquire this on behalf of the owner. It's also possible to trade in domain names, what we call domain name exchanges, in what we call the domain name secondary markets to actually acquire domain names that have been pre-registered that could be relevant for a new product or service you're launching, but somebody already owns it. And usually at a premium, you can then have the opportunity to secure a domain name that would then give your brand more awareness and lift uh, because people already know it. Um, and that in a nutshell um, uh, gives you sort of an idea of some of the things that you need to think about when you're choosing a domain name for your brand organization. Thank you, Moses, uh, for that brief introduction. Uh, I already see questions coming your way. Uh, we shall address them as we go on, right? So in the chat room, I can already see some questions coming and we shall look at them then. Yep, so moving on. After discussing with Moses about getting online, we then asked ourselves, what are the legal issues that we need to look into? Uh, in terms of um, if my domain is hijacked or there's spoofing or there's cyber squatting, all these things. So we asked ourselves, how does this look like? What are the considerations we need to take into place? And I know June has been um, uh, very instrumental in some of the things we see at uh, Kipi today. So I'll introduce June Kashui, uh, who's a principal consultant, JGIP consultants, 
June is an advocate of the High Court and is the principal of uh, JIP Consultants. She graduated from London School of Economics and Political Science um, with honors uh, and French law. She holds an uh, NLM in intellectual property from George Washington University. Um, she's also an associate member of the International Trademark Association, has a lot of experience in intellectual property law and entertainment law, having trained with WIPO in New York, as well as a reputable Australian entertainment law firm, just to name a few. For those who may have met June elsewhere, June is also an acclaimed entertainer, both in on and off the screen, uh, bringing her entire being with a soul and doesn't hold back. So those of you who've seen June on, on screen know that she, she enjoys her music, she enjoys her screenplay, and she's been able to use this, as she says, as a stress reliever. Uh, she launched her album in 2016, and uh, June, I'll throw a plug in now. Uh, her album is on, uh, is on uh, Amazon, it's on MOOC, please download. Make sure you pay. There are copyright issues that we always look at. So, um, June, I hope I get some um, uh, commission for that. But, Karibu uh, Sana, and uh, we welcome you to give us a few of your views on, especially on the legal aspect, which is something we, 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 we tend to ignore from time to time. Uh, we think we are online, we think we are safe. Shortly, I see someone has mirrored my website, or if we go to Twitter, They've added a J to my other one and they're talking like me. So maybe give us a few insights on what you've seen and uh, how we can deal with some of these issues. Karibu sana. Thank you so much, Joe, for having me uh, and to all the attendees, uh, Karibu sana. Thanks, Moses. I think you did a wonderful job just sort of setting the, the tone. Um, and what Joel has said is actually true. We, we think of... Um, legal issues much later when, when uh, things have gone wrong. And because of that, my first statement to all of us is going to be to embrace your legal partners and your legal counsel much earlier on in your process. Um, because if you're able to start thinking about how to prevent some of these things from happening, a conversation with your legal representatives should always come in handy. Um, also, it'll be a lot cheaper for you <laughs> than when you try to look for us when, when things have gone wrong. So just uh, a pointer to, to start early. So this, this particular topic is, is, is really interesting for me because I think the law plays catch up quite a lot of the time. Um, and you find that we, we are developing laws and provi legal provisions based on what is already happening with technology that has run much further ahead. Um, of, of the law. Um, but some of the things that I, I would want to do just today is maybe first start with basic definition so that we don't assume we're all on the same page. Um, I know from what Joel said, we have a variety of people in the, in the room with us. Um, so so we, we know what a domain name is. Uh, Moses has explained what that is, but domain name hijacking is something that you could be at risk of when um, somebody decides to change the registration of a domain name without the permission of the original owner. Um, it could also be through the abuse of privileges of domain hosting and registrar software systems. Uh, and basically for a domain name to get hijacked, it must be a valid domain name. Um, and once this has been acquired, hijacking often involves activities such as um, uh, fraudulent or unauthorized transfers of a, uh, by a false registrar or requesting or changing the registration of a domain name, as I, as I have said. Um, that's a huge uh, risk that a lot of uh, businesses run into. Um, the second uh, uh, risk uh, that is in our legal topic today is domain name spoofing. And this is a common form of phishing. Um, and it usually happens when an attacker appears to use your company's domain name to impersonate either the company or one of its employees. Um, and this can be done easily where somebody sends an email um, uh, using a false domain name. A recent example was uh, an email that was sent out from the who.int um, domain name uh, saying that we should donate during this time of COVID. Um, their systems, their security systems were quite um, stringent and they were able to, to figure out that something was going on uh, quite early on. So somebody had basically created an email address 
that says donate at who.int. And during this COVID pandemic, you can imagine how many initiatives there were trying to raise money. So that's a real life example that happened literally a, a, a couple of months ago when, when this pandemic began. Um, but something that I, I also want to sort of uh, touch on, because I think it helps us to set the tone, even as we think of some of these legal issues, is the thought of domain names as part of a company's intangible assets um, versus tangible assets. So those of you who run companies, you ensure your furniture, you ensure the building that you're in, you ensure the company vehicle and things like that, your laptops. But intangible assets would be things like your intellectual property, your software, and as well, domain names. And I, I wanted to just share a, a, a story. Um, in 2010, um, Mark Zuckerberg, who I'm sure we all know, had to buy the domain name fb.com for $8.5 million because somebody else had registered it before the, the, the existence of Facebook. Somebody had registered fb.com and because a lot of us started using the acronym FB for Facebook, um, Mark Zuckerberg and his company made a decision to buy fb.com. And at that point in time, he had to spend $8.5 million just to acquire that. And there are various uh, examples of people um, who have had to make purchases um, to be able to own the rights to some of these domain names that existed before. And this is just one of those things you have to think about when you're looking at intangible assets and not relegating a domain name to just one of those other things that people can use to find me and my business, but actually considering that it is something of value that you can even put in your in your books of account and your books of record. Um, the other thing is to consider goodwill. Your company is doing all this work to develop uh, goods and services that it's selling or offering to the customer base that you have. Um, so you think about your company name, you register that at the business uh, services registry as a company name or a business trade name. You then hopefully also take your business name and if it is the trade name that uh, the mark and the logo that we see as you're operating you would then also go to the kenya industrial property institute here in kenya and register the trademark around the the business name so my company is called jgip consultants i have a registration a trademark registration over our logo which is JGIP Consultants. And that gives me a 10 year window to exclusively exploit that particular brand name. Now, the likelihood is a lot of us are trading, our trading names or how we are known to the outside world are different from our company names. Very quick example, the Coca-Cola company is registered um, as, a, as an entity, as a company, but one of its brands, for example, Fanta or Stoney, do not have a company of their own. They're not, there's no Fanta Limited or Stony Limited, but those are brands that are owned by the Coca-Cola company. So the Coca-Cola company may not need to register only the Coca-Cola company as the trademark. It will also need to register Dasani and Stony and Fanta and Coke and Sprite and so on and so forth. So starting to think about these as assets, these domain names as assets, helps you to take the precautions you need to much earlier on in the process and even take security measures, which I'm sure Timothy will address, um, to be able to protect them and seal them just as much as you would take out an insurance cover, as I said, on some of the movable properties. So um, I've introduced the element of trademark because it's important uh, and we have uh, a lot of case law. Um, I can cite a couple of case, cases here and uh, in the interest of time, maybe I can share them on the chat as well for you to read further. But basically from the late 90s, the courts um, have viewed domain names as a form of intellectual property that is worth um, protecting. And one of the um, examples uh, that I can cite is a case uh, called One in a Million. Um, it was the parties were One in a Million and the British Telecom, so BT. And basically One in a Million had gone ahead and registered um, several domain names um, basically for the sake of selling them. Um, and so they took things like bt.com, they took things like Marks and Spencer, they took a, a, lot, a lot of other companies' um, trade names and put them as domain names. And 
they ended up in court, obviously, because British Telecom said this is insane. Virgin Enterprises, Sainsbury's, Marks and Spencer's, and Ladbroke Group. Um, this is a British case, of course. And this case even went up to appeal. And the one in a million company's basic job was to help to sell these domain names to people who are not planning to do um, above board business, obviously. So we already know that Marks and Spencer exists as a PLC, as a, as, a, as a registered company. So anybody else trying to buy the domain name Marks and Spencer's will obviously have a malicious intent. And thankfully, the courts were able to see past um, that particular uh, risk and were able to then grant um, the relief that was necessary. And all those particular domain names that had been registered were then ordered to be transferred. So that was a 1999 case, which tells us for many, many years, the courts have already seen the kind of work that some of these fraudulent uh, operators have been trying to do. Um, and so my, my main uh, uh, push really, because I, I want us to have a lot of time for, for questions, is really to get us to start thinking about the, the legal protection. Uh, and at the moment, um, even if you find yourself in a, in a difficult situation, we do have uh, relief measures. Um, Kenick itself has a dispute resolution uh, mechanism that is available, an alternative dispute re resolution mechanism um, that, that it offers. Um, and also the World Intellectual Property Organization, which is the mother uh, of all uh, IP issues, has something called the Uniform Dispute Resolution Policy, which helps to settle domain name uh, cases. And a recent one um, that also came before ICANN, um, uh, Moses shared a Kenya Airways um, example. And there was actually a case um, between Kenya Airways and a lady who had opted to go ahead and register Kenya Airways, I believe .co.ke, if I'm not wrong. Um, and and the, the ruling was in Kenya Airways' favor because it was clear that the intention of this lady was not, uh, her name was Caroline Kariemu, was not to actually, um, um, uh, it was not genuine, let's, let's put it that way. Um, so the case number I will share in the chat so that you can have a read through and the contested domain name was actually kenyaairways.com. Um, and basically some of these cases I think give us in the legal, um, in the legal uh, discipline some sort of relief um, and, and comfort that at least our, our judges and these type of panels are actually appreciating the fact that these are investments that, that um, companies and business men and women are making. So I, I want to just stop there so that we can welcome some questions and obviously hand it back over to Joel. But those are some of the, the points that I wanted to leave us to start thinking over. And I'd be happy to, to share a bit more later on. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, June, for that introduction. Very insightful. And I can already see a couple of questions coming your way uh, around the trademark and um, especially one around what you've just mentioned around Facebook. So maybe we might want to unpack that after Timothy comes in uh, on whether that the, it was an infringement on Facebook TM and uh, these guys were sued by FB. So that's something we'd want to maybe unpack and see in terms of the examples that you have. So thank you very much. Um, as we go along, so we discussed a lot with uh, June and asked ourselves, okay, from a legal perspective, this is how it looks. But then how then do we safeguard ourselves online? How do we ensure that uh, what we're doing is right. Uh, a lot of you, I think, have seen there's a data protection act in play now. Uh, how do we subscribe to that? How do we ensure that our communication is right? The data we are keeping on behalf of our clients is right. Uh, if you're an aggregator of data, what do you do with it? So basically, then we ask Timothy. Timothy, with your experience, uh, how does how does one safeguard themselves online? What are the things that we must look up to uh, to be able to that we must be able to look into when? Uh, safeguarding ourselves online. So Timothy then offered um, just to give us a few insights from his end and uh, I'll introduce Timothy. Uh, Timothy calls himself the big data scientist uh, and he works for an organization called Predictive Analytics Lab. Uh, he's an, a technology enthusiast driving the mobile fast digital posture in the financial traditional media and telecommunications industry. His competencies I will not even go through, they are wide and spread, but anything to do with data, uh, technology, 
Timothy has looked at it, he's analyzed it, and he's decided, let me go and do a PhD on this same thing. So then he's taken up a PhD in corporate governance studies. Uh, one of his mantras as a coach, uh, in terms of his approach to leadership, is engagement and questioning the drive, discovery, and optimizing of employee performance through transformation, while providing pro uh, precise feedback to executive uh, leadership. So Timothy out there does a lot around big data, what do you do with data, how do you use the data, and I'll invite Timothy just to give us a few more uh, views on how he looks at it when we're on the internet. What should we do? What shouldn't we do? Uh, all of us today, and maybe some of you have seen reports where Zoom is hacked, some of your meetings are hacked. What are the things we should be looking out for? So I'll invite Timothy um, to just give us a few brief remarks and then we can move on from there. Timothy, um, we can put up your presentation. All right. Yeah, thank you, uh, Joel. Uh, so I think I'd like to uh, just uh, prepare the audience that uh, in the preparation of my slides, I, take, I took in cognizance uh, two things. So first, the audience has a wide split. So my presentation will largely be focusing on our, our own individual perspectives. How do we protect ourselves uh, in this world that's changing? Uh, secondly, I'll be looking at technical because I know we have a few representation of technical uh, professionals on board. So just how do you need to protect the assets that you are given to govern for the respective uh, stakeholders? And lastly, those of you who run businesses or have a mandate to uh, steward your businesses towards certain desirable frontiers, I'll be just giving you tips on how do you enable that information to be safeguarded. Yeah, so... I think um, I'll be doing that in the form of slides, just to help you have some, uh, uh, some level of uh, memorability to some of the concepts that I'll be sharing. Okay, so I'll start by looking at the very basic of uh, this aspect of security, which is uh, really starts from uh, information governance. And the best way to look at information governance is just to look at the information supply chain, uh, which is broken down succinctly falls into three categories. So there's information acquisition, administration, then application. Uh, so I'll be confining my presentation to what's, what Kenix mandate is, which is registration of our domains. And uh, that means um, it will be skewed mostly towards websites, yeah? Uh, this is a subject that's very broad, but again, as you see the mandate of uh, Kenix has been to be able to provide the right information to safeguard the interests of uh, its stakeholders. Yeah, so in the context of the website now, when you look at the uh, functionalities of a website, it's either information is generated through the website, and then the information goes to, <coughs> goes to a database, and then from the database, the information has some level of application, uh, whether it's a, a bank that's trying to issue a credit uh, facility to its uh, a bank, to its customer, or whether it's a ride for Uber, you know, yeah, so how does it access from uh, acquisition of that information, processing, and then application? Now, when you look at the aspect of security, it cuts across all these uh, domains. And I think mine will be to look at how exactly do you need to secure yourself yeah, to keep this value chain uh, impenetrable in, in, in yeah, yeah, by threats. So yeah, uh, the other aspect will be to assess the evolving nature of our uh, the industries and uh, the ecosystem that we exist. Uh, so, of course, we are continuing to experience a flurry of uh, information. Uh, of course, you must have read somewhere that uh, there is a compounding uh, generation of data across uh, different ecosystems that we interact with. Uh, the advent of digital communication has ensured that there's more data being generated than ever before. Uh, the definition of data has since moved uh, to accommodate new types of data such as voice, images, and uh, video. Uh, we've seen evolution of technologies also being able to evolve to accommodate and processing of unstructured data. Now, all those um, things that attract uh, attention to uh, touch points of our consumers and how data is acquired. Uh, so for example, biometric data is now a key asset that has been targeted by, uh, targeted by uh, hackers, okay? Uh, we are looking at social media. Social media does a lot of unstructured data because of the text 
uh, element of it. If you remember last year, Jeff Bezos' uh, phone was hacked and uh, the reports were actually indicated that it was hacked through a WhatsApp, uh, a WhatsApp uh, attack. So because of this advent of this ecosystem and the evolution of this nature of uh, uh, ecosystem, we are seeing new ways and new tools. And that's why the attention now turns on to big data to see what solutions can big data provide. And of course, before you is a, a chart that shows the very spectrum of data both in, within the organization and also uh, externally outside the organization. And this full range of data is a key attraction point uh, that makes hackers want to come and access the information. Uh, you'll be able to realize that uh, organizations that handle uh, massive volumes of data yeah, have had to invest in uh, very expensive uh, firewalls and security systems to insulate themselves from such attacks because it's a very, it's always a continuous, uh, they're always exposed to continuous attack uh, using various techniques that have evolved uh, in the market. So this is the, how this looks pre big data and after big data. So traditional security operations and technology, they were looking at logs, events and alerts. But you can see under that uh, iceberg, there's a bigger uh, need now to uh, widen the spectrum of our security. So we are talking about identity context. You've seen cases of identity thefts yeah, happening uh, locally. Yeah, so people stealing your ID and then being able to clone your SIM card and even digital cloning happening on social media, fake news yeah, happening on social media. Yeah, we've seen uh, web text pages being mimicked, uh, email and social activity being hacked, uh, business process data, people being interested in uh, stealing IP information from various uh, contexts, customer transactions being interrupted, uh, like things like credit card transactions being interrupted and uh, cloned yeah so we these are the kind of uh, evolution we are seeing and uh, the new interventions that are being provided by big data are enabling uh, spontaneous and quick uh, recovery and not just that even predicting whenever there's a foreseeable threat uh, looming in the background and just to show you these are some of the techniques that are used to drive decisions for security uh, so we've got uh, tools we use in big data analytics such as uh, anomaly detection yeah, so detecting of fraud for networks. We've got pattern extraction. Yeah, we've got text analytics, looking at the relationship between different entities. We've got network graph analytics. Uh, we've got um, then predictive machine learning. So at the back of this, actually, what drives it is availability of data. So because of logs, which are generating spontaneous data at specific touch points with interactions of consumers and that technology. But at the back end, there are algorithms as well. So that data meets algorithms and those algorithms are able to compute using certain defined parameters and being able to assess patterns of a repetitive nature uh, that can be able to pose a threat to the uh, environment of uh, the business ecosystem. So that's the place of big data. So just know that there's data and then there's algorithms on the other side. And using that patterns can be able to de be developed to mitigate and uh, prevent a foreseeable threat. So I wanted to move to the next part, which is just providing you with the key indicators on how this uh, impacts on the website uh, ecosystem. So first, just to show you uh, this, uh, the website security protects your websites from uh, these five kind of uh, um, uh, five kind of uh, mal practices. I might call them that. So we've got number one, which is the DDoS attacks, so which can slow or crash your site entirely. Yeah, then there's blacklisting. So you can actually have your website pulled down yeah, or flagged or even have um, visitors not visiting it because of uh, a threat uh, that uh, could be indicative of uh, some underlying weaknesses in that uh, website. We've got defacement, so which uh, replaces your website's content with a cyber criminal's malicious content. Yeah, yeah, we've seen this happening a lot, especially in uh, competitors who are trying to um, align each other. Number four is uh, malware, so which is malicious software. Uh, very common threat used to steal sensitive customer data, distribute spam, and allow cyber criminals to um, access your sites. Very key, especially in the banking and uh, credit score and uh, elections. And every time there's an election, there's a lot of data that's being stolen from um, digital assets. Then there's number five, vulnerability exploits. So cyber criminals accessing your sites and data stored on it by exploiting your weak areas in a site, 
like an outdated uh, plugin. So this is actually being exploited mostly in this era of our crypto mining. Yeah, so we're seeing a lot of our, our uh, devices actually being accessed by crypto miners and they're using it and accessing information and not just information, also GPUs. Yeah? So they use the central processing units of our machines to process uh, uh, the, 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 the cryptocurrencies that they represent. Now, second, I would like to see uh, to, to talk about the visitors. So you've seen how to protect what, what, what you need to protect your website from. Then number two, you also need to know the visitors to your website, what do you need to protect them and why? So number one, stolen data. So every time your uh, users of your digital assets come in to log in, they leave what you call the digital breadcrumbs. So they leave in trails of their email addresses and passwords. So these passwords are cached or stored uh, somewhere in your server. So it could be one of the key um, ingredients that drives uh, people to come and hack into, the, into to those assets. There's what you call session hijacking. Yeah, so, so for example, Zoom. Yeah, so this is what we call the Zoom uh, bombing, yeah. Uh, so we've seen Zoom doing a big a big change uh, in early April, where they transitioned their servers from AWS to Oracle, a process that took just about seven hours, and uh, just to ensure that they have a more secure environment for their customers. And already some churches, I saw a church in the US suing uh, Zoom because of a, a one of its sessions which was attacked. Uh, so this is session and jacking can be very very. Uh, costly for the organization. Then number two, CEO spam, SEO spam. So unusual links, pages, very common. We see this happening a lot uh, because of what you call baits. Yeah, and an undesirable deflection of traffic from our sites to other undesirable sites. Uh, number four is malicious uh, redirects. So certain attacks redirect visitors from your site, very intentional, especially new sites. Yeah, and uh, betting, uh, sports channels. Uh, you can see a lot of this, the websites that uh, derive a lot of revenue from uh, clicks doing that. Then number five, phishing schemes. Yeah, so it doesn't happen in emails or some text from the web pages that look legitimate but are designed to trick the user into providing sensitive information already. That's one thing that you need to be cautious about when you are assessing or doing an audit for your website. So lastly, just uh, recommendations on what you need to do. One, ensure you have an SSL certificate. It protects your data in transit. Yeah. Number two, software updates. Yeah, so websites hosted on a content management system yeah, have a higher risk of compromise due to vulnerabilities and security issues often found in third-party plugins and applications. So every time you're working with your developers, be very keen to cross-check and cross-validate some of the plugins that they're using. And then thirdly, a web application firewall, a WAF, yeah, so it stops automated attacks that commonly target small or lesser known websites. Yeah. Then lastly, website scanner. So a cyber attack costs a long text to be found, so it's time for the essence when a site experiences an attack. So this looks for malware vulnerabilities, and some of them are open source, some are actually enterprise, so it'd be good to have this investment in your inventory. Yeah, so I think in a nutshell, that's what I have to share this point. And I look forward to having a lot more uh, shared during the Q&A. Uh, that's my contribution to what the other two speakers, Moses and June, had uh, done earlier. Back to you, Joel. Thank you. Thank you, Timothy, for that insight and the presentation. I think it, it, the presentation can be scary especially by the fact that uh, we all want to be online at every point, but at the same time, there are people out there who are looking for opportunities for us to, for them to do bad things online. So thank you very much for the do's and don'ts, and also just some of the recommendations that someone would take in. Um, I'm, I'm looking at the chat and the Q&A area, and uh, I had prepared a couple of questions around uh, to the panelists, but maybe I'll take a few from the floor first, just to address some of the questions. I've seen Moses and June have been responding to some of the questions. I don't know if there's any that has not been responded to. Uh, just give me a minute, I just check. Um, yes, um, maybe to June. Um, there's a question from Bola. I don't know if that has been responded to. Just around, should we register all our brands and a single, single trademark? For the business like the coca-cola company so should we do all okay. of them together 
it be separately done? Yes. So and maybe, um, maybe okay, just go ahead. Can we add, can we update and add other brands as we create them under a single trademark? And okay. where should we do this? Yes. All right. Let me uh, thank you. Thank you for those questions, Bola. Um, so let me let me just walk us through briefly the trademark registration process. Um, I'll start with Kenya because that's where we are. Um, the registration happens at the Kenya Industrial Property Institute. Um, the process requires that um, the proprietor or the, the, the person seeking registration first declare what the good or service is that they are seeking to offer. And there's a list, I believe, of about 45 different classes of goods and services. So you would need to first select the classes that relate to the kind of business or service that you're, you're offering. Um, you would then also need to determine whether or not you want to protect the name. Um, so for example, Kenic, K-E-N-I-C, as just a name or as it appears behind Joel in the form of an already uh, branded logo. So one would be what we call a word device and one would be called a a word mark and the other one would be called a device mark. You also can protect things like colors because there are certain colors that are um, associated with certain brands. So it gives you a list of things that you're capable of doing. Um, and thereafter you make your application, there's a process of searching uh, because the examiners would first need to search the database to confirm A, does anybody else have a pending application in that particular classification you have selected? So let's say, uh, I, I, let's use the example of Coca-Cola. We know that it's a beverage, predominantly a beverage uh, company. So they would have gone to the relevant class and said that I have several uh, brands below me that I have developed, uh, different beverages, uh, non-alcoholic beverages that I would seek to, to protect. Each of those are standalone uh, marks. So the proprietor would be the Coca-Cola company and they would have to file separate applications for Fanta, for Stony, with the different logos as they have been branded, for Sprite, for uh, Dasani, and the rest of the, the beverages that they have um, on their on their on their list of, of products. So each of those would then be uh, examined and assessed, and if they meet the criteria, and there's nobody else, let's say selling Fanta shoes or Fanta fashion. Um, those are some of the things that could come up before the registrar to determine whether or not these two marks can coexist. So if you always remember that the test for trademark infringement is likelihood of confusion, you need to be able to demonstrate that if these two marks are allowed to coexist in the same market, then the customers and the consumers will get confused and will benefit from one person's goodwill over the other. But you can imagine that maybe shoes and beverages are quite separate and therefore the likelihood of that confusion happening is very low, one would argue. And the registrar could therefore make a case that if your particular application is in class 35 and mine is in class 28, then these two markets are not going to clash and I can allow the two brands to coexist. So in your process at Kipi, which takes approximately eight to eight months to a year. It's, it's, it's quite long. Um, they basically go through an assessment process and the registration that you get if you are successful would therefore allow you 10 years uh, exclusive protection within the territory of Kenya. Now, I'll just throw in a little bit of information in terms of international trademarks because um, I know we have an international audience, uh, but also a lot of us are seeking to do business in various territories. And therefore, there are treaties um, that are signed because intellectual property is one of those uh, uh, sort of global topics. So Kenya is a, is a signatory to a lot of these treaties. And there's the Madrid system, which allows international registration of trademarks. Therefore, with one application, you could apply once and list the number of countries that you seek to do business in. Uh, because this is going to be your, your face and the way you present yourself to clients. So if you're starting in Kenya, you are allowed in your one application um, through the Madrid, Madrid system to say, I also intend to go and do business in the following countries and to have my products 
on offer or my services on offer in these other countries. And then you would pay, of course, a much higher fee. The costs are not, they're not friendly, but if you consider the fact that you are avoiding the logistics of going to each and every one of these countries, hiring a trademark uh, uh, attorney to then go and do the local processes for you, then that could possibly justify the higher rate. And then if there is no other existing mark in those countries, um, then you would probably be able to go ahead and get a successful registration. So um, international trademark registration through one application is also possible, um, but we always advise that start with the country that you are doing business in. If you seek to branch out and expand your business, then give yourself about a year to start doing the research um, and, and then go ahead and file the application. So in, in, in brief, Bola, you cannot load up brands uh, or products under one application because at the end of the day, as businesses, we know we are always rebranding. So when you register the word mark, K-E-N-I-C, it's probably a safer bet so that if Joel decides tomorrow Kenik is going to rebrand and change their logo, you still have protection over the name the name and the word, uh, word device, uh, and you have freedom to then go and change your branding and your... Sorry about that. Yeah, so that, I hope that answers your question. Uh, the simple answer is no, but I threw in a bit of uh, information there that sort of gives you what your options would be. So, so you, those would be separate applications in brief. Thank you, June. Uh... I think, yes, you threw a bit more into that uh, conversation. And I think it also answers one or two other questions that were asked, I think, by Njogu around um, in, if, if I register a .co.ke and someone else tries to register .com, who has, can, can I sue the company number one or company number two? So I think what I'm, what I'm getting from that particular conversation is maybe as we give back notes to the panelists, we might need to cite a few cases and uh, do's and don'ts um, that, uh, that people should look at from an IP perspective as they're going to register uh, their yeah, trademark. Joel. Yes. Yeah. On, on that question you've just asked, I think yeah. the, 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 there's so many components of that question that I would need more information. I can't say yes or no. Was, yeah. was that your business registered first? Um, are you offering the same services? Are you in the same territory? You know, is there proof that one saw what you are doing and then copied it or mirrored it? I, I have so many other questions before I can say yes or no. But the advice I would give, um, as you see a lot of these corporations doing, is if it is Kenick, then register kenick.com, kenick.co.ke, kenick.org. They go ahead and make the investment to cover all of them so that they do not expose themselves. I know a lot of us are starting out, but we may not have the, 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 the financial capability. Okay. But with the example I gave of Facebook, if your company increases in value, then you have to pay a lot more later on. So when you're starting out and it doesn't cost that much to register a domain name, I would advise that try and do as many of them as possible right off the bat um, and, then, and then secure them so that you avoid these kind of scenarios. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, thank you. And I think that also, uh, I saw in the chat you tried to address uh, Kamundes, Kimathi Kamundes' question around FB uh, and the fact that uh, it was not an infringement case, uh, but more of Facebook acquiring these assets. So I think, as you're saying, as the value of the organization goes up, then also then people are targeting you a bit more. So maybe we would need to dig into, to be a good case study again to look at where FB came from and why they first paid $8.5 million and they continuously are paying. So it's safeguarding some of the um, uh, IP and the trademarks that you have from the onset as opposed to waiting. But of interest, again, to your conversation is the fact that if possible, then if you can earmark the country or territories that you want to trade in early enough, uh, then you can secure those as opposed to waiting later where someone may be able to mirror uh, what your business is doing. So, yeah, so thank you for that. And uh, I think we'll, we'll come back to you, June. I'd just like to take a question on behalf of uh, Timothy. I don't know if it's been responded to um, about SSL. Could you elaborate on what further steps are there to secure a site? Timothy, are you there? And uh, yes. this is a question from Emmanuel. Maybe you could address that one. All right. 
Yeah, so, so SSL, which stands for Secure Sockets uh, Layer, uh, is a technology that's used to encrypt the information flow uh, between the browser and the server. So information can be uh, accessed uh, every time there's a transfer of that information between the server and uh, the browser. Yeah, so what this SSL does is uh, it uses algorithms to encrypt uh, that, those packets of information which are being uh, relayed. Yeah, so if you remember in uh, the second slide, I showed you the range and the spectrum of data that uh, uh, we, gen we continuously generate in our businesses. So I think the further steps for you will be to assess what are the levels of risk uh, that uh, uh, the data that you are relaying uh, for, from your websites. Uh, so we, then you can be able to assess and uh, assign uh, a corresponding SSL certificate that's uh, of uh, uh, significant sophistication based on the nature of your industry. Yeah, so one of the things it does is uh, uh, it does uh, enable, uh, SSL enables inscription and then of course verification of identity of the site owner, yeah. So there are different levels of SSL and the further levels will be to us, one, do the assessment of the risk. Maybe if you are doing a banking, a banking solution or you're in the banking space, you use a more, pretty much more sophisticated uh, SSL uh, layer than someone who's probably doing uh, just an uh, education or, or mobile, any, anything to deal with the membership database kind of a subscription service. So I think for me, that would be what I have to show you for, uh, uh, to tell you now, but I think there's more um, information I can share with you offline in regards to that. All right, thank you. Thank you, Timothy. I'll just bring back Moses for a quick question that we've received. Uh, in these times of COVID, we see that things have been accelerated. Everyone is now going online. Um, they all, all want to have a digital business and they have to adapt. To, to what we're going through. So from a domain name and association of services perspective, what do you see the implications going? What, where, where do you see ourselves in the next six months? Or I, I, I was in an online church the other day and someone said by September COVID will be over. Where do you see us uh, maybe six months down the line? In terms um, of yeah, I think from a sort of, uh, if you think about digital as, a, as a, almost like a, a new territory, as it were, in terms of before COVID and when, when we are now currently in COVID, I think what has generally happened is that there's a, there's a big joke that everyone said is that every, what COVID has done is it, it's inspired digital transformation across the board, meaning that what used to be nice to have has become a must have. Yeah, so today, for instance, you find that so many companies have had to now add on uh, e-commerce capabilities to their businesses so that they can sell uh, products and services because consumers are no longer leaving their homes. Children are no longer leaving home to get education. So I think what we have now is a new sensibility around the fact that many things that we did in a traditional way, we are now doing in a digital way. And I think from that perspective, what's happened is that consumer behavior has been utterly transformed. Uh, meaning that today's consumer is so much more aware of what is possible digitally, Take in case, uh, for instance, this uh, forum we're having today, we're doing it over Zoom, whereas a few years ago we would have done this in a physical space. Um, and we have this new appreciation and sensibility around how digital works and how you can actually use it effectively. So going forward, I think companies are going to have to start investing in obviously building websites that are more than just brochures, uh, e-commerce capabilities, um, mm -hmm. video conferencing and things like chatbot as, uh, as a way of customer service. Uh, we have this sort of heightened sense of um, you know, consumers and the businesses and organizations that now realize that this is actually a viable way of engaging. And in one way, I think I'm really excited is that many small businesses uh, that traditionally would not have been able to look at this seriously or would not even have had the capacity, suddenly they're new vendors and service providers who've innovated and created affordable products that allow them to go online in a commercial way, in a way they could not have done before. So ultimately, what I'm trying to say is that I think we have a scenario here where uh, in the next few years, I think we're going to see a much more uh, digitally sort of competent or capable uh, population where people now sort of start to think, do I really need to go to the supermarket for two hours or can I go online for 15 minutes, do my orders and they're delivered at home and that frees up time for me to do other things. On the business side is do I need to have my office nine to five when potentially I could be selling product 24-7. So we have this new 
sort of perspective around this new paradigm where digital essentially is becoming front and center of pretty much everything that we're doing today. Uh, thank you, Moses. So I think the, the question then is, or the, the realization is we are all going digital. It's, it, we look at it probably as it's been new, but it's not very new. It's, it's probably just been heightened by the fact that uh, the pandemic now causes us to look at things a bit more differently. But uh, thank you for your comments on that. Um, I would like to, uh, June, if you're still with us, there's a question there that uh, Kimathi Kamundi has just posed. I'll, can I give you a few minutes just to look at that? Although you had mentioned that there's the aspect of you'd want more data uh, to understand. Uh, was Kimathi exactly. the same? Was yes. he the same one who had asked that first question? On FB, yes. Okay, okay. Do you want me to give um, you a few minutes to look at it or you can answer it? I'm, I'm actually just scanning it now. Uh, okay. Okay. <laughs> it's what we call perusal <laughs> when documents <laughs> are being <laughs> scanned quickly by lawyers. Uh, I'm doing a scheme read uh, because, okay, man, that is. Yeah, okay. This is, this is, um, this is an unfortunate case um, just because of the fact that, yes, the, the names are very similar. I do agree with you that um, there could have been better, better uh, back checking that could have been done at the registry. Um, and maybe, you know, I'll say at the outset that there needs to be better communication between the various business registration and trademark registration portals. Um, if we look at a quick example of Rwanda, all of this happens in one office um, where you do your business and company registration, where you secure your intellectual property, all happens under the same roof. Um, and therefore they check all the databases. So if you had um, your company in existence prior, um, then there's, there's a very close connection between the, the company that was then registered after you. Um, more importantly, if you are offering similar services, um, because that's one of the things we, we are supposed to declare when we are registering, um, what kind of business um, are we going into, then, then that in itself, I believe, was, was the first, um, let's call it the first faux pas. Um, and maybe uh, the, the second company should not have been successful and should have been asked to, to secure a different uh, business name registration. Um, the fact that you also have um, uh, a trademark concern now and a brand reputation concern with the fact that the, the first company you've talked about um, was then um, shut down and that there's now um, an element of confusion in the market that people still think it's your company that was that was shut down, um, which which gives you some sort of negative brand um, reputation. So, if they're not operational, then you know I would have said maybe go sue them for reputational damage and try and get some some financial relief from there. Um, but it sounds like the, your first relief is. Um, because they're no longer operational, is to try and do a little bit of marketing online to spread the message um, that your business is still on, it's legit, and maybe put out a little statement if you've actually received complaints, um, you know, a very simple note to your customers and to those who pass through your website, just sharing that, um, that there's been um, a few of you who have contacted us with this concern, we'd like to categorically state A, B, C, D, E. Um, and that, that sort of communication constantly with your customer base helps um, to, to, to protect your brand um, reputation short of releasing a, a press release or, or going to the dailies. Um, use, use the platform that is already yours to, to communicate and try and clear up the confusion. Um, if the company was still in existence, I think, you know, possibility of filing some sort of um, matter may have come up. Um, at the moment, I think it's, it's difficult. Um, could you also um, possibly look to see if you could write to the registrar to see if that particular company could be struck off um, the, 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 the list so that they, because the, the, once, you know, once these companies are registered, we are um, in the public domain. Anybody can query and search the database. So um, that might be one way of trying to, to retrospectively um, um, solve solve some of those of, of those questions. Um, that's all I can say at the moment. Um, but if I, I'm happy to share my email and we can have a conversation about that later. Um, but I hope that helps even a little bit. 
Thank you, June, for that. Um, I think, um, as you've rightly said, maybe it's something we can dig in deeper and obviously offer um, uh, um, offer some um, case studies that people can then look into. Um, I see one hand up in the from the part, uh, participants, Tom. Uh, we'll allow Tom just to, uh, he's put up his hand from when we started, so we can allow him just to uh, to give his quick remarks. Tom, are you there? You're unmuted. Tom? Tom? Okay. If we can't find Tom, we'll try and get him back. Uh, maybe just a question, bringing back uh, Timothy. Uh, Timothy, there's, there's been a lot of questions around uh, now that we are going into the fourth industrial revolution, which is, we're now talking about big data, machine learning, artificial intelligence, internet of things. These are now playing a critical role, especially now with COVID, eh? uh, where we are seeing people now coming up with apps on contact tracing uh, and all those kind of things. From your perspective, how will this impact digital security across the board in totality, looking at this whole new area that we are sort of like being thrust into faster than we imagined. So in a nutshell, what, do you, what, what would you say from a digital security perspective? Just, I think just from the outset, and this started uh, in late March, uh, from, from an enterprise perspective, we, we could see there was a surge in demand for uh, VPNs, eh? the, the virtual private networks. So as our most employers are rushing to secure uh, the assets which were able to create a safer working environment for the employees. And as we move uh, forward with the recalibration of our business models, you're seeing most employers are trying to adapt to the new normal of uh, having to hive off uh, uh, the big percentage of the employees to start working uh, remotely. And uh, for sure, that's going to create a huge, huge uh, shift in terms of uh, uh, the security assets. Uh, we are already seeing a lot of requests coming in for uh, auditing of our um, internal communication systems. Uh, we were, at least some organizations were at uh, different levels of maturity in terms of uh, that. So of course, you've heard about the BYOD, bring your own device, uh, which essentially meant employees could come to the workplace but uh, work from their own devices. Yeah, so right now it's uh, pretty much the same, only that it's been compounded. Uh, you bring your own device, you're working from your own device, but also from your own infrastructure. So uh, we, we, we're going to see a shift and a demand uh, for more of these uh, secure environments to create more enabling safety environments and safety nets for employees to, uh, to, 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 to function. Uh, and then also in terms of uh, the security of uh, uh, the employees and the details that they share online, uh, we're going to see a lot more focus being given to websites uh, that generate cookies. Yeah, so if an employee is watching a movie, for example, there's a platform called Mobdraw. Mobdraw is a, is, 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 is a, it's, it's a, a platform that's, uh, I don't know how to call it, uh, it steals movies from content from other content producers and streams it illegally. Uh, but uh, when you log in there, it actually tells you that uh, we're going to have access to the websites that you visited. So you, we see when an employee is there watching a movie or even watching a football game or something on some of those platforms and is using the same network or the same device that he's using to work from, then there's a bigger risk of those hackers uh, having access to the, uh, to, the, to, the, to the environment. Yeah, so I think a lot of awareness needs to be done. So moving forward, first, awareness. Um, then two, uh, development of policies, uh, working from home policies and the IT infrastructure needs to be created more, more robust. So that's my observation in terms of our uh, post-COVID situation. Joel? Okay. Timothy, thank you for that. Yeah. Um, I, maybe just an additional just comment from you is a question around um, someone has just asked how do we also secure when we are going on to social media 
Twitter and those things. So you've talked about websites, but yes. we are seeing now people creating parody accounts and all those things. Is there something that we could do? Or mm -hmm. uh, because these are international platforms and there's not much we can, uh, we can do on that end. Is there any options? Yeah. Yeah, the, the, of course there is, and uh, just to, 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 to make you aware that there are four types of data that you'll find on social media platforms. Uh, one is service data. Service data is the information that you volunteer yourself on the platform before you use it. Uh, for example, if you go to Twitter, it will ask you for your name, email, and date of birth, with some are optional. Some you can't access the platform unless you give that information. So we have a bit of identity theft uh, that happens during uh, giving of the service information. Uh, in that regards, these platforms have created some measures to uh, create authentication. So for example, you'll find verification through an email, um, OTP one-time password through your mobile phone, and uh, a quiz, a question, uh, security questions. So we are finding an evolution in terms of uh, this. Uh, there's also use of uh, uh, unstructured data and uh, machine learning algorithms such as facial. Uh, recognition. Uh, we are now seeing the use of uh, natural language processing, voice biometrics, uh, which will start to be used uh, to secure the to secure these uh, platforms more more firmly. Uh, but then again, the second type of data that we give is uh, what we call the disclosed data. So that's information that you give out by yourself. You're somewhere. You tag yourself. Uh, you upload a photo of yourself. You put a comment. You like a page here and there. That's disclosed. So how do you secure yourself from that? So uh, there's uh, what you call the metadata, which is information that's derived from the, uh, uh, from the primary data that can be built a profile uh, and are used to reveal some certain patterns around you. So uh, one of the ways to secure it is through awareness. Uh, we uh, run a series of what you call the digital detox, uh, which enables employees and uh, citizens just be very aware about the type of data and digital breadcrumbs that they leave behind and how do they secure that. So I think it's the right, now is the high time for employees and uh, uh, people working remotely to see what kind of information are they giving online that cannot put just the employer and, and even their families at risk, yeah? Uh, because now you, you're gonna be revealing even where you, you stay. And uh, it goes even beyond social media. We have got the fitness apps uh, that we keep using. Yeah, so this fitness apps actually someone can even know where you stay. Yeah, and, uh, in this age and time where you share, we might be seeing a lot of uh, challenges being shared on Facebook of uh, face, I mean of the of the um, and the, the, the those uh, running apps of uh, the trails. Uh, this can actually reveal where someone so someone can actually come, and uh, you know, and desirable things can happen to you. Yeah. So the last part of is uh, derived data. So this is processed. Uh, it's like the Cambridge Analytica now. So we leave ourselves at the mercy of uh, uh, the tech platforms that are able to process and uh, decipher meanings around that data. So not much can be done at that point. The only thing we can do is uh, to protect ourselves using policies. And uh, like I like the fact that we have a data protection law that was uh, effected uh, last year in November that's being used as a guideline. Though it's not really uh, been enforced a lot locally, but for those international platforms, I think there's a lot more being done to ensure that there's a, uh, enforcement, uh, there's a litigation they face when they abuse some of those uh, parameters laid out. Yeah, so thank over you, to you. Thank you, Tom. Thank you, Timothy, for that. And uh, I still see Tom's hand is up. Uh, I don't know if he's still available to ask his question or make his comments. Um, I'm cognizant of time. We had planned to finish this by 4 p.m. So I just wanted to get some closing remarks from each of the panelists just on um, their view. Uh, where do they see the industry going three, four years from now? Uh, we are calling this the new norm that now we shall not be meeting physically. We shall be having more meetings such as this. So maybe just um, in finality, maybe your sweeping comments on um, your view of where do we see ourselves a year down the line, two years down the line. Um, as we do that, I'll just put up another poll, which is basically some questions that we had, um, some topics as Kenik we have chosen to discuss as webinars and would want your input as our esteemed um, guests to give us a guidance on which is the next topic you'd want us to discuss. And then we shall get the, the um, 
the, the, the right panelists to come and discuss the same. So you'll see the topics there uh, in subsequent uh, webinars. We want to carry that, this out at least every two weeks or so. So if you could give us uh, your poll, vote on which one you want, then we can be able to gauge which is more, more important at the moment and we'll be able to bring this to you. So as people are going through the poll, I'll invite uh, Moses just to give some closing remarks. Moses. Uh, yes, thank you so much uh, again, Joel. And it's been a pleasure uh, being on this panel and attending this uh, first webinar for Kenick. Uh, for me, I think in, in, in closing, I think I'd have to say that everyone now needs to, you know, we've been working as practitioners in digital for a long time. Um, and I think for us, uh, this is the moment, I think in some ways we had not anticipated. The circumstances are somehow painful, but with this new normal, or what many are starting to call the next normal, um, we have a, an opportunity to capitalize on the fact that the whole world has gone digital. And as a result of that, that means a lot of opportunities are being created, but at the same time, they're going to be winners and losers. They're those who will transition well into this change. They're those who are going to struggle. And the thing is to arm yourself or to prepare yourself for this next normal. And that means making sure you have your domain names, give more attention to your digital assets, uh, and start creating content and, and value propositions that actually allow you to uh, not only retain customers and, and stakeholders, but also to acquire new ones. So I think, if anything, this is a great opportunity to, to use this new uh, digital landscape to, to sort of accelerate how your, you know, your organization is performing and take full advantage of the opportunities that it presents. Thank you very much. Thank you, Moses. And um, being in the industry for quite a while, I think uh, it must be good business roaring for you guys now that more people want to get onto digital platforms. So we wish you all the best. And uh, if any of the participants then want to get in touch with Moses, we shall share his link and his presentation when we send the, the email with uh, the questions and the recording. I'll invite uh, June just to give some closing remarks. Thank you so much, Joel. Uh, like Moses, I'm very um, honored to have been part of this uh, first uh, Kanik webinar and um, well done for starting and we look forward to many, many more. Um, I'm a fan of conversations and sharing information. I think I've learned a lot today from both Moses and Timothy. Uh, I'm the farthest thing from a techie. So, but as you rightly said, we've all been thrown into this situation. Um, and it reminds me of a, of a paper that I did for my uh, master's when we were talking about information privacy. Um, and that the, the reality of the situation is a lot of us get onto a lot of these sites, we click, I accept, we don't read the terms and conditions. We, we want the service and the, the, the thing that's being offered much more than we think about our uh, information privacy. Um, and I think for me, that's always in the back of my mind, even as a lawyer, because when I'm logging on to Facebook or Instagram, I'm not thinking like a lawyer. I'm thinking I want to get onto these platforms and I want to see what's on offer. So similarly, um, the same thought process would need to be uh, considered, especially now that we're talking about our businesses. Um, and I think because of that, you have a lot more people in your ecosystem to consider. The, if, if a domain name hijacking or a spoofing or a cyber squatting issue arises or phishing, the, it's not only the rightful right holder of the domain name who suffers. You will, you will have already um, acquired a clientele, a customer base. Um, there'll be reputational damage. They could suffer at the hands of the other people who have uh, hijacked your domain name or who have engaged in, in some of the other um, um, you sort of uh, malicious behavior that we, we've talked about today. Um, and so if you think about it from that point of view, there's a lot more to consider when we're jumping into this digital space. And my, my appeal is that we, we read up on it. You have um, some great experts here who can help to explain and to give you what, what are the things you should be cautious about, even as you're taking your business from let's call it an analog space, and now by force entering um, this digital space, whether it be your employees. Um, I've seen a few people asking questions about what happens when your employees are now you working from home, you know. Um, so the, the exposure is quite wide, um, but I think take the initiative, even for those who are setting up their businesses, it's never too late to register your trademarks. It's never too late to register your software through the copyright uh, uh, body, which is the Kenya Copyright Board. 
that's how we register software in Kenya as a literary work. Um, so I'd encourage everyone to read up on it and, and secure your domain names as part of your IP and your intangible assets because it is possible to do so. Um, and thank you for the opportunity and all the best to everyone. Thank you. Thank you very much, June. I think there's also, I might need to invite you back. There's a, there's a big conversation happening around uh, the merger of some three entities. Um, and, yes. and how that will affect us as we continue to register and secure our domain name. So I think that's another conversation that we need to look at. Um, sure. Is it going to affect us in a way that uh, we have these three into one very big body and how does that look out for? So maybe that's a, a discussion that we need to carry out. I know it's happening okay. in other forums. Um, I have yes. attended lawyers forums. I didn't understand half the jargon. So maybe you need to break it down to us. Uh, <laughs> As, as domain owners in Haiti. So thank you, thank you so much. Um, last but not least, Timothy, um, your final thoughts, matters security, matters data, uh, matters data protection act, what, what would you like to tell us? Yeah, I think mine will just to, uh, first thank uh, Joel and Tim and uh, my fellow panelists for I uh, think uh, creating the insights that I've been able to act as a conduit for focusing on uh, uh, what current context we are experiencing. And maybe just to urge the audience to consider this as a black swan event that is uh, going to steer us towards the fourth industrial revolution. Uh, I know we've been oscillating between third and fourth, third and fourth. Uh, some of our organizational uh, ecosystems have not really evolved from the third uh, industrial revolution into the fourth. But I think this is an urge and a push that forces us uh, to not look backwards, but to embrace the new normal as painful as it is, and uh, uh, we are seeing different uh, business recovery curves emerging, that those businesses which are having a, a W business recovery, there's U, U shaped business recovery, there's V shape, I saw another one, the square root shape business recovery. And I think uh, we're all gonna be faced with one of those curves, one or the other. But one thing that's certain is that uh, the new normal will be virtualized. Yeah, so the earlier and uh, uh, more quicker we embrace the virtualization of our, uh, our, the way we serve our customers, virtualization of the way we interact with the employees and virtualization of our products. And the earlier we do that, the better. So that's uh, my submission, my closing remarks. Thank you, Timothy, and thank you for those closing remarks. I think, yes, as you've said, this is now uh, the way we are going to operate. So we, be, we should be ready for it, we should invest in it. Uh, your business plans should now speak to this a bit more. Uh, I know a lot of us are very reluctant to invest in security. Uh, maybe this is the time and this has shown us that uh, there is more that needs to be done. So thank you to my panelists. But uh, before I close, I'd also like to recognize uh, a couple of people who in the background have been helping us quite a bit. Uh, one is uh, an organization called ICANN, which is the Internet Corporation for Assigned Names and Numbers. Uh, that's where we get our, our breath from as, as Kenik. Um, they helped us a lot in putting this uh, conversation together. A lot of these conversations are also happening at a global stage. So um, the representative in Kenya, Bob, and his team have been quite instrumental in getting us to where we are. The other uh, organization is Africa Top Level Domains, others known as AFTLD, uh, run by a gentleman called Barak, who has again uh, been pushing this agenda. He's ensuring that we are always talking domain names. He's, um, we're always making sure that people understand why domain names are a currency or, as, as Juna said, um, an intangible asset. So it's, we would like to thank him and his team also for putting this together. Um, Internet Society of Kenya, ISOC, with uh, Kevin, again, giving us quite a number of sound um, advice in terms of how we look at our business and how Kenik should run all the way. Uh, Dot Survey through Moses helped us again with the branding of this um, event today, and we thank him and his organization. Uh, last but not least, Communications Authority, where our home is as Kenik, and uh, always at the back end, making sure that uh, we're doing the right thing, their support is invaluable to what we do. Um, with that, I'd like to thank again the panelists, and last but not least, the attendees for registering accepting to come your afternoon. Some of you, I know now uh, it's about how to get home in time. Um, 
So thank you, thank you so much for registering. Thank you for joining us today. Thank you for contributing. There are a number of questions that we as a team also need to go back and address. So I think the document that we shall send back will have to have some very cross-cutting conversations that you guys have brought up, some of the questions that we struggle with. Um, and every time we struggle with them, we then want to look for answers. So you've asked us some of those questions and we shall find the answers and respond to you. So thank you, thank you so much to everyone and uh, keep safe. Um, we, today was the only day we were allowed not to wear masks. So we'll go back to wearing our masks and head home. So keep safe. Uh, keep your family safe and thank you. Thank you so much. I don't know if we have the results of the poll uh, Which we could just put up as a final So based on the questions that we had asked uh, Which is the next topics? It's the they're neck and neck uh, With how to keep your remote employees cyber secure top in the list. So again, we shall always uh, We shall try and look at how to assist on that uh, I guess it, it speaks to a lot of people that we're all working from home or working from uh, secure locations. We have VPNs and all that. So I think that's a vital conversation that we need to have around how we keeping our employees safe and not only safe, but secure safe, cyber secure safe. So thank you once again and have a good evening, everyone. Thank you.